It's a great honor to be able to introduce um, Shahida, whom I've actually known for um, quite a long time. Um, and Shahida started her, and who I, I think is one of the best journalists who is working out there today. Uh, Shahida started out at the BBC and um, has since done many projects and uh, many different pretty crazy things, as you can tell from this. Uh, but I do think that this, uh, personally, as someone who's covered uh, Ukraine and um, has seen a lot of other films on Ukraine, I do think that this is uh, my favorite film on Ukraine and not just because um, you know, I know the author. So it's great to have Shahida here, and it's also great to have Katya Patton, who is um, uh, was because it's always um, you know it's always the kind of the 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 big brain behind the film who gets the credit, but it's never it's always the teamwork that goes into making any film. And Katya was one of the producers on the film and played a key role in. Um, making it um, all pull together, and so it's great to have both of them to to talk about it. So, but we'll, I'll I'll start. So, just jump in whenever you want. Uh, but I'll I'll start with um, why you decided to choose the airport. Why why you decided to um, how how you came to decide on the actual theme. But also, um, but before we get to that, actually, can you tell me what what was the reaction to the film? And was the reaction what you expected? Well, the, the reaction was very mixed in Ukraine. They, the general public who watched the film didn't like it for many reasons, mainly because they were objecting of having uh, separatists um, alongside with the Ukrainian soldiers, and they thought it's extremely unfair. And I totally understand from the point of view of Ukrainian media and whatever was produced about airport, it was like very patriotic, our army is the best. And to see them in the state where they saw them now being completely crashed, demoralized, <clears throat> and see the other side having an advantage is painful. Uh, so it was quite badly received in Ukraine, uh, but otherwise we got uh, one of the major, uh, the, the best price in one of the major Russian film festivals, ironically, um, last year, which was to me a recognition of the work we've done on this film. We, our team wanted to provide a, a picture of utter hell which both sides suffered in a very short time, within two weeks, before the airport fell completely. And Shahida, as someone who's um, you know been going to Ukraine and covered you covered it throughout the war, you know there are lots and lots of other stories. I mean, I, I, the airport is completely iconic and very symbolic of the war, but there are lots and lots of other stories that you, obviously you could have done um, in Ukraine. You know, from the children to the elderly to the you know there's no shortage of stories, as you know. We were just talking and about the children. I'm the airports, but <laughs> I'm late to the airports usually. <laughs> <laughs> but no, why did you? Yeah, why did you? I like airports and the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> I really love airports, and the whole thing of me thinking all these people are stuck in one on two floors, and and I'm very claustrophobic. So I just imagine myself being in one of those floors, unable to leave, at the hell, and I'm like, oh my god, this is World War Two a movie. And then I read an article by Oliver Carroll about one of the soldiers who was in the film, actually, whom Katya found, Slavik Galvanets. And he was on the phone. He talked about what they've been through. And these children were completely abandoned by their commanders. Believe me or not, in the last week of the airport, there was no senior commander of the Ukrainian army over there. And I thought, oh my god, it's horrible. So I got to do a story about it. And it, to me, it, it looked like a film. So and how um, I think talk us through a little bit of the uh, through the process a little bit like what did it take how how did how did you nail the characters how did you find them and how most importantly how did you convince them to the instrumental to? person of finding all the Ukrainian characters was Katya mm -hmm. she was tr she was doing a lot of work trying to piece all these Ukrainian articles about it, the foreign articles, getting in touch with them. So the Ukrainian soldiers were to be cut his work and I let her talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, well, the easiest way to get a hold of them was through the volunteers. They were always constantly in touch with the soldiers, had their personal cell phone numbers, were constantly writing to them and 
knowing like if they needed any kind of food, winter gear, always in constant communication. So for a number of the soldiers, it was quite simple with Slavic, who from the beginning, we knew we had to have him to make this movie, we needed him. Um, it was a little more difficult. His story was quite complicated because he was also held in which prison. One, which so one is that? Slavik is Gavinets, and he's the youngest one. His um, the one who was twenty-two in prison. Yeah, yeah. Here, the twenty-two. Yeah. Um, and he was held particularly long ca- in captivity. And his father actually traveled to the other side to negotiate his release directly with Zaharchenko, with the um, so-called leader. Yeah. Yeah de facto leader of the Nets People's Republic and he had switched his phone off he wasn't communicating with any journalists once he had finally been able to get back home to his family so we were only able to get in touch with his father and had to write a letter asking if we could speak with his son and this was only I think we started reaching out to him it had only been a few weeks after he had been released from captivity so that was particularly challenging but once we got him on the phone Um, I think we caught them right at the period where they're just really ready. The final shock had worn off a little bit and they just really wanted to talk. And did everyone say yes or were there more people that you tried to get? I think because we, we spent a lot of time really choosing who would be able to tell. Because we wanted soldiers who were there the same days fighting on each other. So we had quite like a select group that we wanted to be in it and everyone was... That was actually what surprised me the most, um, is just this really willingness and need to speak about it. And also, um, it had been covered by Ukrainian media, but not so much by the international media and the international <coughs> press. So I think they wanted this kind of different perspective where they didn't have to sing this kind of pro-Ukrainian narrative, but give some of the complexity and be asked questions that aren't just going to give the same formulaic answer. Um, But, and so. um, would you tell them that uh, Motorola would be in the same film? Did they yeah, know? I mean, well, I mean, not specifically Motorola, but we were completely upfront from the beginning that this is going to be a different project. Um, this is going to have both sides on it. And um, I think that actually sparked their curiosity quite a bit. Um, and I know when Shahida, when she was traveling uh, in Donetsk and speaking to the soldiers, I thought it was quite interesting that they always were asking, well, what are they saying about us on the other side? Um, because they, they don't speak to each other, they don't watch media from the other side, so this was quite a rare chance to actually hear the dialogue. Yeah, they were very curious. Actually, it's much more easier to speak to soldiers than the commanders. Did you speak to any of the commanders for the film? Yeah, I spoke to one of the commanders, the commander who actually abandoned the soldiers the last week of the airport. He just got in the armored vehicle and left them. Uh, that's the commander we spoke to. But then when, when, and we also talked to a very good commander who was actually um, in touch with the, his ch- soldiers were mainly um, in the airport and he just broke into tears when I asked him, do you, do you think about them? And he would just started crying and just said, what do you think? Of course, every day. Because um, his battalion provided like 80% of the people over there and, Mind you, there are so many bodies still un- unrecovered from the airport and not whether they ever be, will be able to identify all these bodies um, because nobody knows, nobody's doing anything over there. So we have a lot of unnamed soldiers who are buried there, bo- on both sides actually, uh, because the separatists have never said how many um, casualties they suffered over there. The same goes with the Ukrainian um, side. And why did you decide not to include that commander in? I mean, I'm sort of curious about the editorial thinking be- behind what I think what makes the film so powerful that it's so focused on just the people who were, who were in it. But I'm sure it was so tempting sometimes to include a little bit of side story, a little bit here or there. Like, so with the commanders who were part of that story, why did you decide not with to? With the commanders and the Ministry of Defense and General Headquarters, we decided not to include them because they were, as far as we're concerned, there, was, there would have been a different story, it would have been a new story rather than the story about these kids. I wanted them to be heard. I wanted people to feel what soldiers feel when they fight each other. Um, and I think them talking, and we set them set on different, from left and right, you can, there is a dialogue between them, the dialogue which never happens between um, 
the now you know unrecognized Donetsk and Lugansk areas in Ukraine proper. It's exactly what's happening in this film. They never spoke. They've been so close to each other, never saw each other. But they, they were happy to kill each other for no reason. Um, it was very hard to trace down the separatists because um, they're a difficult bunch. But uh, I was lucky because at that stage they still were uh, letting the international journalists come in. And they, quite, they were quite friendly actually in um, giving us access. For example, all this airport footage you have, uh, we're talking to them, we spend more than a week there and every, every time we had the full access to all the floors, um, which was amazing, I thought. And how long, um, you know, because I, I recognized a lot of um, people from the separatist side in the film that I've had, and my, my kind of most memorable interaction with Motorola, uh, which will tell you what these people are like to deal with, was when he came up to me. We were just going into the airport to do some filming. He came up to me and he went, You to Brunik Pravirim, you know, you want me to f- test your flag jacket. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, the, just to like, give you a little taste of what, what, what a lot of them are like and what was um, and Motorola had he was one of the best known commanders who as some of you know probably he's died recently he was killed um, what was it like sort of working with him and w- with them and what was it like to interview him in particular how much how much kind of patience did he have for questions he was actually amazingly polite uh, he didn't want to do it in the beginning, but then he agreed. And before us, he was talking to the Russian journalists, and he was swearing all the time. And I was thinking, oh my God, I'm going to beep this interview. I'm going to do it. But then he turned to me and was like, okay, what do you want? I was like, okay, you know, we're doing this film, this and that. And I was like, okay, let's go to the military training field. So we went, and he spent virtually half a day sitting down while we were preparing the set and everything else and then it, he took us to the airport. I don't know, I mean I was probably lucky or maybe he had, he wanted to tell his story because what you've heard is just probably 10% of what he said. It was probably the longest interview he, he gave to anyone and um, I asked a lot about his personal life and he was quite happy to answer that. He was quite uncompromising about Ukrainians, of course, unlike anyone else. Everyone else was quite, quite sympathetic in a way. He was quite brutal. But then when I asked him, well, where is your, what is your motherland? And he was like, my mother in the Soviet Union. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So said, and if it's needed, we're gonna go and, and reunite the whole country. So I was like, are you talking about Uzbekistan too? Because I'm from Uzbekistan. I said, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. <laughs> So um, it's good that he's not with us anymore, <laughs> probably. Uh, yes, um, otherwise they were okay. And you were there during the fighting, so I remember watching that whole interview and just constant shooting in the background to the point where you had to stop at yeah. some moments, like the, um, the scene that's in the movie where the flag falls, that, I mean, that none of that was staged, that was things that are happening. It wasn't you know, staged? Not, <laughs> well, yeah, but it's just shocking right at that moment. You know? But the best part was with me and Justina, Justina, the photographer, who we came to uh, interview Givi in that DVT yeah. Tashka. And yeah. oh my God, that was just horrible. And they were shelling like probably 300 meters away from us. And you're sitting on the seventh floor, this totally dilapidated yeah. building, waiting for this commander to think, oh my God, what is happening? What's going to happen? Anyways, it was destroyed completely. It doesn't saying, exist anymore. She was saving the building. She actually went out of the airport. And she said, you want to just like, no, I don't want to go. Oh my God. Kate, is there anything, I mean, you've seen all the, all the B-roll, the footage, the interviews. Is there anything that was in them that didn't make the final cut that you wish had or that particularly stuck with you? Um, it's quite a lot, actually. Um, all of the, I mean, the interviews, you, I guess what went into the film must have been two or three minutes for each soldier, but these were hour and a half to our interviews. Um, the one that stuck out to me the most was um, Ruslan or Baghdad, as I think he's called in the film, because uh, he had quite an epic story himself coming into the airport um, and being left in an open field with just a few soldiers. 
Um, and I think we took just one of the lines that he remembers turning around and seeing the cars and the, the headlamps on the car just turn around and drive away. Um, and he spent, he spoke to Shahida a lot just about what that feels like, seeing these cars turn around, having just a dark snow-covered field in front of you, um, and seeing such a big military guy speak with such emotion. Uh, I think it was a really touching moment, um, one of the many kind of side stories in this saga. Um, and then other just small bits, uh, all the soldiers speak about each other a lot and remember seeing each other in the airport or um, I think it's Vitali, one of his lines always really stuck with me. He says, I remember, um, we, I remember all the guys, but I remember the way they laugh, the way they smile, even the tone of their voice. Um, and to have a man, a military man, sit in front of a camera and say this, it's, it's um, very, yeah. Ukrainians hated the film. Did you ever hear from the um, people in, the, in Donetsk, from the separatists? <coughs> they like the film. They like the film? Yeah, they like the film. They, they thought that this film is pro-separatist because it shows the strength of the separatist army, which is totally missing the point, but anyway. I think anyone who watches the film feels quite sympathetic to the Ukrainian voice. And it was, um, and I felt this way, even though I was supposed to be like more neutral, but they are, they're amazing people who have incredible courage, uh, being left like this by their commanders. And then later on, those who were imprisoned and released cannot serve in the army anymore, treated as traitors which is very unfair. You had criminal this. cases. Yeah, and criminal on. cases against them. And then Poroshenko... Some Poros of the people who are in the film. Yeah, yeah, they're all kind of treated as traitors. And then Poroshenko gives these medals to the keyboards, the defenders of airport. Yeah, we all like to know this, this brave story of the defenders, but how about these guys who actually stayed there till the very last moment? And they were all volunteers by that point. Yeah. No, yeah. no Ukrainian army was there at that point. They were, no, no, they were part of the they were part of the, but they yeah, were they were volunteer yes. battalions, yeah. But I, I, it may be too early to kind of judge the importance of the whole airport, the, the battle um, in the war, or maybe not. Like, what do you, what role do you think it played, the battle itself? They shouldn't, have, should, they shouldn't have been there to start. It was obviously ob obvious, even to me, that they would have lost it anyway. There was no way they could have you know, survive the battle. So what's the point? Evacuate the people, save the lives. But somehow, Minister of Defense thinks differently. But every single significant battle in this in this uh, war, they've lost, except Mariupol, miraculously. Yeah. I'm curious if the lack of positive acceptance in Ukraine for this film has to do with an issue of pride because it paints the communities in such a negative light for having left these boys. Is, is that an ongoing problem that like people maybe in Ukraine don't even want to talk about this because they don't like how it, how it turned out and how their army... It's uh, painful to admit the defeat. Yeah. Um, and I understand, for as a human to human, I do understand their reaction. Uh, and if you watch the Ukrainian media, it's extremely patriotic, it's extremely, um, you know, we hate separatists, all of them who live in the series of separatists and baddies. But it's not the way to to end this conflict, right? Were you, um, were you surprised at such lack of acceptance? Did you think they would show it in Ukraine? Did they show it in Ukraine? They didn't show it at no. all in Ukraine. They didn't. You have a question? We, we did a very close session for um, editors of Ukrainian newspapers and major media outlets in a hotel like um, when it was produced and the reaction was horrible. They hated it. They hated it. They hated it. me. They, they, they thought that I'm like pro-Russian um, journalist. Went to the point of, what's your business? You're from Uzbekistan. Yeah? That's what I was going to ask. I was just interested in when you talked about them being uh, criminal cases going against them. Was that something that Anyone who's captured with being 
were, were, were being treated as, as traitors. Yes, everyone who's been imprisoned is a traitor by definition. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I'm just curious about um, about the process in terms of you had lots of material and how you first how did that actually work with all of that material to build the kind of art for that? And secondly, um, about the framing a little bit as well. Um, I mean, you, you, you presented as the faces there, the story there, um, and how the reactions are for people that, for example, struggle to contextualize, you know, how many how essential that battle was, how, what the losses were. So what were your decisions in that? And, 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 and the decision not to give context to people that may come from to this from an outside. You know, kind of having this hat on the periphery rather than front and center when they, when they see the film. Well, uh, I had a very good director, Andrei Yerastov, who is um, Russian and he's in Moscow. And the, uh, the storyline was done by both of us. We wanted to do the, make a film which it, cannot, it can be in Syria, it can be in Ukraine, it can be anywhere else. We have two opposing mm -hmm. sides sitting next to each other. People who are gonna watch this film without know the, knowing the context 20 years later will understand that there are two opposing sides. That's their story. Uh, we would have done a bigger film, a, a longer film. There was a major problem with that there was lack of B-roll video. And um, even now watching it, I noticed that we should have used more. Unfortunately, all the video materials from the last um, few days were from the separatist side, all of them. There, was, there were no Ukrainian journalists there, so we had to use their videos, which we bought, but it was not enough. Not enough to cover everything. That was the main, main problem with that. And the soldiers themselves weren't filming anymore at that point. Because um, Baghdad, he, like you seen it says, a photographer, and he had quite a lot of video from earlier, but after yeah. a certain point. It was we didn't have any electricity, nothing. He was photographer, he was photographer. But like, he was, it was like, his book is like from like the whole world. Mm -hmm. and from the airport, it's like, usually it's kind of portraits of each other, you know. It's not a reporter, it's quite interesting. So you filmed the singing scene where they're singing the Ukrainian anthem. It's his footage. Oh, it's oh, huge. It's yeah. it's, I think he just did a little bit, but that was one of, uh, he put it That's up on his, his Facebook. Ah, and it was, Bandai, yeah? yeah, it was incredible. Ah, you have sorry, actually, I'm curious, uh, do you think if you were uh, in the Ukrainian, ethnic Ukrainian or ethnic Russian, I know that would make any difference to shoot this film. Okay, and another question is, uh, you know, it's uh, you're showing uh, to me very masculine world, you know, men's point of view of viewing of the world, you know, and it was, uh, uh, you are a woman, right? I mean, how it was for you uh, this, uh, if there was any different perception if you were actually thinking about it, that what you were in this in terms yeah. of gender things. Well, I think if I was ethnic Ukrainian Russian, mm -hmm. it would have been a different film. And to be honest, I would have never done this film. Like uh, I prefer, I'm from Uzbekistan. I prefer not to cover Uzbekistan because I'm biased. You feel differently for this kind of film. You really need to be out of you tool outsider. Um, secondly, me being a woman played an advantage because I'm, I'm quite small and when a big man see me, they feel sorry, they feel protective, so they can't really abuse me, you know. Uh, and it's number, number two, I think they all need therapy and when they see a woman sitting with them talking, they feel more comfortable. And then ca and there was only me and Andrei Yerastov who was behind the camera, so they felt quite intimate. And I asked a lot of personal questions. And at certain stage, we had to break certain interviews because they were just breaking into tears. So I gave them time to breathe, you know, and then they <coughs> kept coming back. It was, it was good for them to talk these things through because they, in Ukrainian army, they don't have therapy um, things, sessions for their 
for uh, people. And the same with separates. I think they feel just if they feel sorry that I'm so small. <laughs> we all do Shahida. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> Which is a, a good thing. And then, yes, of course, if a man would have been doing this, it would have been a different film, more like, yes, a lot of shooting and guns and everything else. I was looking at them like a, a mother who has two boys. And I was thinking, like, you know, if my boy was there, oh my God, you know, I would have gone crazy. Um, so that there was more woman um, attitude to all this thing. Other than me. How long did it take you? Filming itself? The like filming, filming yeah. like two weeks probably. Matrol took a long time. He was thinking a lot. For him, I had to ha get make a separate strip. For Matrol? Like for yeah. Only for Matrol, yes. Um, yeah. The rest were less um, difficult. Yeah. Uh, so, mm -hmm. what are your future plans for this film? Do you want to take it out on the circuit? We can't take it to the circuit because unfortunately Ready for Europe put it online right away oh. and it's not good because... Why? Let's not dwell into this <laughs> painful issues. Uh, yeah, um, somehow they decided that they wanted to have a lot of clicks on the website. Yeah, they had a lot of clicks but we lost all the festivals because you can't really... It was nominated to certain festivals, about 10 I think, not bad, but we can't really win anything because it was already online and it's already online. So therefore, it's um, my present to Ukraine. Let's put it this way. How long do you think it'll take before Ukraine wants to accept your present? <laughs> Ten years. Yeah, there was another, you had another question? Yeah, I'm curious also about the... Um, and, and that this, forgive it, this is not, uh, not fully kind of articulated as a point, but it's, you have a tremendous symmetry, yeah, in the film, of course, in those juxtapositions, and you said that, that uh, the video footage was not quite as symmetric in terms of what you had, uh, what you could have worked with on the side, and the symmetry breaks more or less, I think, at the point of the capture of those individuals, and then my entire evaluation of what of how you describe the situation changes yet again or there's added to that to hear that those poor people that have been I mean, it, gone through that horror and losing their friends upon return seem to be outcasts so i'm curious was that did you at any point toy with the idea of still including that that a homecoming for the, those stranded people wasn't a homecoming, but rather further ostracism, because in some ways it almost seems an even further kind of um, part of that kind of, of that terrible trajectory. Um, we thought about just, it, that, it would have taken us... I'm not us coming with, a, with any opinion, I'm just curious in terms of how that decision and, and what the trade-offs were there. We thought about it, but then it would have taken us away from the of the airport and then I had to ask questions would have had to ask the Minister of Defense and mm -hmm. I think it was it would have been extra uh, you plus a very important thing that we um, this film was made in a very difficult um, situation within the organization I work for because it's a bit pro-Ukrainian so you had to trade off a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, and so the compromise was we are not including this painful issue how they treat the soldiers but the certain issues would should be addressed to the Ministry of Defense which actually for a year doesn't want to talk the Ministry the, of Defense the Ministry of Defense but the they've seen the film maybe. I've seen the film uh, I have a lot of questions to them uh, with the same with the general headquarters they just don't want to talk and I have Recently, I've been to Ukraine again, like two weeks ago, and we, we were in the front line. And it's the same story of soldiers. There's shellings every day, and they still don't have cars, generators. The volunteers are making clothes for them, everything, including bandanas and, you know, these things, even underwear. And you have people sitting in the Ministry of Defense doing exactly what? And exactly the same question what people are in the field, the commanders are asking, like, why nobody investigated the failure of A, B, C, D? Why these people are still there? And that's a question I want to ask, probably never. 
So is there is there more for you to tell on, on the story of Ukraine? Are you setting your sights elsewhere for future stories? No, I watch Ukraine. Ukraine is part of our um, big audience for the for the Nastasia Lea for current time. Um, you personally, in, in film world, you want to do another movie on Ukraine? No, but I was working this year on a film which is not mine, but I was co-producing. It's about Syria. So it's from one war to another one. The film is going to be in January in, um, in Sundance Film Festival. And it's a long, it's a feature film. It's, it's an epic journey of the five years of Syrian war. Lot to fit into what an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So one day it's going to be probably in um, after it goes through the circle of festivals, then it will be available. Thank you. Yes. Great work. Congratulations. Uh, question is about uh, we all remember this saga, but uh, symbolic uh, and strategic importance of this. Uh, there was no strategic importance of this airport. It's not what I say, that's what the soldiers are saying. The airport is disconnected from the main, um, how do you say it, the um, defense lines in Pesky and the, all these little, little villages. And it's, it's right next to Donetsk. So when you compare the forces of separatists and the Ukrainian army, you know that it's absolutely no winner then by that time the separatists c um, controlled the key ways to the airport. So what the Ukrainian army was doing, they were um, shelling it from the tanks and other heavy artillery from the nearby villages. We didn't have any, any value because they were shelling into their own people. It was ridiculous. Nobody investigated. You remember they were mentioning the explosion. We still don't know who did that. It's a mystery. But the major loss of life as a result of the two explosions that happened needs to be investigated properly because at least 200 people died there under the rumble. Uh, somebody should take responsibility. And you don't know because there were shellings from two separate um, villages on opposite side and the separatists were shelling. So everyone was shelling. There were tanks in everywhere. So you go figure. The gas also was never oh, investigated. Oh, gas? No one gas, knows where gas it is a mystery. Uh, I want to ask you about those contradictions. Like, uh, some of the in some of the <coughs> there are a few things that uh, one side mentions and another saying the quite opposite. So I was wondering about the, uh, and I also noticed that in your film you didn't really uh, like put any of the facts of like how exactly like what happened or like how things went because uh, uh, it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like that these people died um, because of nothing again. Uh, there was no aim to it, but um, do you think that uh, there was some kind of like objective truth that like also is uh, um, shown in your documentary, or is it just to is it points to see that there is like these people were basically dying for nothing? I for, I cannot investigate the gas attack as well as the big explosions. There should be people who are professionals who investigate these things. I'm a journalist. As far as I'm concerned, I interviewed people who were there, and that's their story. But for me to say that the separatists done it or the Ukrainian army did it, it's an allegation. It's not one I'm gonna take responsibility. I'm not a military person to figure out from which direction something would happen. You know, it's not me. It's not my job. All I'm concerned with, it was stupid and people died because of somebody's stupidity. And But people in the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense would understand this <clears throat> probably very respectful gentleman that there's somebody's children there. And they just don't think about it. You know, when Slavik's father sent this um, emotional YouTube appeal to the president of unrecognized Donetsk Republic, he said, please take me because he's the he was the only son. Take me instead of him because his mom is you know, almost dying. And that's what people, what men don't understand, fight. The people who take decisions. For them, they're just meat, like Motorola's. They were sending meat. So Motorola was right. He was right. They were sending people to die. But also, you know, it's like, you know, you talk to them, they also soldiers, volunteers, they believe in the same Why? Because it's really work on them. Then so many people wanted to go there. 
want to be there. I agree, the but the, they're that? amazing what soldiers. What was that? You know? They're amazing people. Fantastic. To the stage that when I told one of the Ukrainian commanders, oh my God, I really want my children to be like your guys. Unbelievable. Decency, honesty, kindness. The commanders on top, the people who take decisions are there. Because they're essentially going to the rescue and save the guys which were already in the nurse so it was like, yeah. Yeah, why? So what's the point? Give them the, give the support to them. You lost anyway so many battles, for God's sake. Who cares about this piece of shit? Yeah, in Soviet, one of the soldiers almost answers a question in the movie when I think Shahida asked him, well, why did you go? And he was almost confused by the question. He's like, those are my guys. I couldn't leave them. I mean, it, it's very black and white. He had a choice to stay behind. At the end of the day, if you look at, at this airport, this is what? The ruins. They were fighting for the peace of whatever. Plastic. Exactly when you see in Aleppo, what are they fighting for? With all destroyed buildings, 